This is the Library Channel, your place for news and information about the ASU libraries. I'm your host, Fred McElvain, and today I'm joined by University Archivist Rob Spindler. Hi, Fred. And Curator uh, Carrie porter Brace. Hi, Fred. And we're going to talk a little about ASU Science Pioneers, a uh, new exhibit up here in the Lures Gallery on the fourth floor of Hayden Library. So, Rob, what was your inspiration for this exhibit? Well, in uh, 2008, it may not be widely known that we have the 50th anniversary of the dramatic election that uh, enabled Arizona State College to be renamed Arizona State University. And we've already started thinking about that and, and thinking about how to celebrate that uh, seminal event in our history. And at the same time, we were interested, we'd recently been collecting the papers of some early science research faculty at University Archives, and we realized we had an opportunity to tell a story about the origins of big science at ASU. Certainly, uh, big science is a big topic here at ASU and the Crow administration, and we thought there was an opportunity for us to talk a little bit about some of the faculty who began getting very large grants from federal agencies and were ultimately the pioneers of science research at ASU. Interesting. A little background. Um, ASU started as uh, Arizona Normal School. Yes, the Arizona Territorial Normal, Normal School, School, founded in 1885, and it went through uh, five or six name changes in its history. And each one of those name changes represented an expansion of the curriculum of the institution. And so when you come to the mid-1950s, this was an institution that was teaching in a wide variety of fields that you might associate with the university but we'd not really reached the level of research in science fields that uh, we typically associate with research universities. So there was a very difficult time in the mid-50s. We had a couple of faculty who were doing some really important work, uh, people like Herb Stonkey and his Poisonous Animals uh, Research Laboratory, and they were beginning to get some um, actual research grants but most of the money we received from the National Science Foundation were actually to fund summer institutes to help train teachers in schools on how to teach science and mathematics. And this was largely, uh, uh, particularly in the late 50s, in reaction to the Russian launch of the Sputnik uh, uh, satellite. All right. So who would you say, in the exhibit, you're, you're concentrating on five people. Who was the earliest? Well, Herb Stonkey is the, the key guy. I mean, he actually received uh, two direct legislative appropriations in the mid-1940s to establish the Poisonous Animals Research Laboratory. And what they did ultimately in that laboratory was make antivenom for scorpion bites and for uh, snake bites that uh, were uh, common to our particular region of the country. The scorpion antivenom that was produced here uh, was effective uh, for particular types of scorpions that could be found in the southwest and Arizona. And uh, we have one letter on display in the exhibit that indicates that as many as a hundred uh, victims per year uh, were treated using this antivenom. Cool. Let's talk about meteorites. I notice we've got a bunch out there. Carrie, where did you get them? The Center for Meteorite Studies. There's a new gentleman who's in charge of the collection. His name is Lawrence Garvey. And it was kind of a fun process because he's becoming more familiar with the collection. And I sent in a request that we were interested particularly in the very core, the very beginning of that collection with uh, Carlton Moore and H.H. H. Neininger. We went over to the center and, and got looking at some of these wonderful things. Now, uh, my request is that we kept the meteorites small enough mm -hmm. that we could safely keep them in our cases. They have <laughs> meteorites over there that are huge, I, absolutely, and heavy. These things are dense and very when heavy. When I went to school here many years ago, uh, the Union actually had that, that large planter box that's by the cafeteria area, actually had three very, very large meteorites just sitting in it. Wow. <laughs> so uh, which professor are we talking about in 
with the meteorites? Well, there's actually two individuals that we associate with the meteorite collection. H.H. Uh, Nininger was actually a lay scientist who had developed an international reputation as an expert in meteorites in the field of meteoritics. And he approached a man named George Boyd, who became the ASU's first director of research. And they developed a relationship in which ASU was very interested in helping Nininger advance his research. Um, ultimately, in 1962, ASU uh, wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation, an extraordinary proposal that uh, enabled the Science Foundation to provide the funds for ASU to purchase the meteorite collection from Mr. Nininger's. And uh, that was the event that ultimately resulted in the founding of the Center for Meteorite Studies. Carlton Moore, who was in the first class of uh, Regents professors here at ASU, was brought from Caltech to serve as the first director of the Center of Meteorite Studies in 1963. And uh, so it was the combination of Nininger and Moore that uh, helped ASU enter the world stage as a leader in the field of meteoritics. And this ultimately positioned ASU uh, to uh, get many other large grants through the years um, dealing in the areas of astrophysics and planetary geology. And uh, certainly we're now a, a very important institution nationally and internationally in these fields. Uh, what are some of the other highlights of the exhibit? Well, uh, we have the collections of Dr. Carlton Moore, Dr. Herb Stonkey, Dr. Charles Wolfe, uh, Troy Payway, and Leroy Iring. Leroy Iring, thanks. And what kind of artifacts? Well, we brought in some things that related to each of these scientists. For uh, Dr. Stonkey, we couldn't, of course, put in live animals. Yes, so but those snakes are pretty scary. They, they look pretty <laughs> real, don't they? Uh, those are courtesy of the Arizona Taxidermy Artists Association. They've got two very active members who offered to uh, bring in their work for us to display. We've got uh, Mojave Green Rattler, which is a national award-winning piece. And the- Is that uh, the larger of the two? No, that's the smaller of the, the smaller two. It's in the two. upright case. And then uh, Rattlesnake, I think it's a Western Diamondback Rattlesnake in the other one. Uh, and we're getting a Gila Monster on Friday. So, <laughs> so look forward to that. All right. Um, so tell me, about some of the other research we're celebrating here? Well, I think some of the fun things about this exhibit are the fact that some of the research that was conducted in the 50s and the 60s uh, relates to some very current topics. Um, Troy Payway was a soils geologist who uh, ha had a couple of different interests. He had worked in uh, permafrost studies relating to Arctic regions, but he was also very interested in the geology of the valley and did uh, a great deal of mapping of the valley. We we have a couple of maps on display that show areas of fissures in the southeast uh, valley in Chandler and Gilbert area and this has received some uh, media attention recently as a, a state agency has opened up a database where showing maps of where these fissures are so that individuals who uh, purchase properties or real estate in the southeast valley uh, have a sense of what their risk is in terms of these fissures. Payway was out there mapping these things in the early 1970s and so uh, his early work uh, ultimately led to the information that will help thousands of, of consumers make good decisions about their real estate purchases. Another uh, area of interest is Charles Wolfe, who is a geneticist, and he was very interested in making connections, uh, studying populations of individuals and the likelihood that they would uh, contract certain forms of cancer. Uh, he came from Utah where they have a great deal of interest in family genealogy and he combined his uh, interests in genealogy and genetics with uh, attempts to predict the occurrence of cancer in certain populations. Um, and uh, this is, uh, of course, an important uh, uh, area of research today as we try to develop more predictive forms of medicine and medical treatment. But here was Wolf doing this work in the uh, early 1960s. 
So well, it's, fu it's fun to see how these things sort of come around again and again and how our technology enables us to do more and more with uh, similar directions of research. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful exhibit. I want to I want to congratulate both of you because I think it's it's very striking, and I hope we have lots of people coming to visit. This one was a lot of fun to install. <laughs> we wanted to do something different. We wanted to make an impact, and I think with the graphics and the topics and some of the things we've been able to add, that it's probably our best one to date. Excellent. Rob? Well, this was a very challenging exhibit to conduct the research for because our sources really are very thin. Uh, regarding early research at ASU. We have some pretty good collections of faculty, of certain faculty members, um, but we know that there was more that went on here, especially in the late 60s and early 70s as the university really developed and became a more active research place on a national level. Um, so it was a challenge to put this together, but uh, I really enjoyed learning about these individuals and the uh, early history of research at ASU. Well, thanks for joining us today, Rob and Carrie. Uh, please come visit the exhibit. It's beautiful. It's on the fourth floor of Hayden Library. And thank you for watching the Library Channel.